All right. Well, welcome to uh, services on this uh, fifth day of unleavened bread. We're currently in the 19th day of the first month. And based on our reckoning of the calendar, we're in the 42nd year of the 40, 40th Jubilee. I'd like to uh, start services by asking James if he'd please open in prayer. If you all stand for the opening prayer, we'll turn the mic over to James. James, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Our Father, Yehovah. We give you the greatest appreciation and thanks from, for learning about your will in our lives. We follow your law completely. This year we leave our land follow so that the land can recover from our six years of harvest. And instead of draining the soil, the Crops will go back into the soil and strengthen it, cause it to be renewed for the next seven years approaching so that our harvest off the land remain with the plenty you have given to us, which we greatly appreciate. We saved up so we had extra food for this year as instructed so we follow your ways completely as we are able as we learn new things perhaps we accept those and introduce them into our lives so that we can follow you completely and in following this way of life we understand that we from year to year, really from wave sheaf to wave sheaf, we are able to know you and your way better and act more proficiently, and be better ambassadors to all those we come in contact with, of the effects of following you and your way of life, and that really we know all mankind won't, but we few, we happy few throughout the world follow you till the end of the time of the 6,000 year and the time when you'll send your witnesses witnesses to all mankind to explain your way and your law to all the world every eye shall see them I give you appreciation for your thorough plan of reconciliation for mankind and help us all be good witnesses and ambassadors of your way so they can, as we're dealing with all mankind, we can be good representatives for you and that we feel confident that our actions and everything we do and say properly represent you so we give you the greatest appreciation for your words and your law and that we can fulfill them more completely. So we give you thanks for all that you've done for us, all that you're doing for your people throughout the world. We give you appreciation for life itself. And we would ask for all this, please, by the authority of your son, Jesus. Messiah, amen. Amen to that. Thank you, James. Appreciate that opening prayer. If you'll remain standing and take up your hymnals and turn them all the way back to page one. On page one, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 1 titled, Blessed and Happy is the Man. That's uh, page one, blessed and happy is the man to start our song service on this fifth day of unleavened bread.
Okay, well, that's a good start for our service today. If you'll now turn over to page six, on page six of the hymnal, we'll sing our second hymn titled Vindicate the Justice You Command, and this hymn comes from Psalm 7. After which, we'll turn the mic over to Wes to read in the book of Leviticus, chapters 13 through 15. But first, page six, vindicate the justice you command. Okay, if you'll all be seated, we'll now turn the mic over to Wes to read in the book of Leviticus chapters 13 through 15. Wes, over to you. Am I on? Yep, you're good. Okay. Regulations about infectious skin diseases, chapter 13. The Lord Moses said to Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin that, that may become an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of the sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on his skin. And if, it, if the hair in the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be more than just skin deep. It is an infectious skin disease. When the priest examines him, he shall pronounce him ceremonially unclean. If the spot on his skin is white and does not appear to be more than skin deep and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest is to put the infectious person in isolation for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to come in to him. And if he sees that the sore is unchanged and has not spread in his skin, he is to be kept in isolation another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him again. And if the sore has faded and has not spread in, it, in the skin, the, the priest shall pronounce him clean. 
It is only a rash. The man must wash his clothes and he will be clean. But if the rash does spread in his skin after he has shown himself to the priest to be pronounced clean, he must appear before the priest again. The priest is to examine him. And if the rash has spread in his skin, he shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infectious disease. When anyone has an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to the priest. The priest is to examine him. And if there is a white swelling in the skin that has turned the hair white, and if there is a raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic skin disease. And the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He is not to put his he is not to put him in isolation, but he is already unclean. If the disease breaks out all over his skin, so as far as the priest can see, it covers all the skin of the infected person from head to foot. The priest is to examine him, and if the priest the disease has covered his whole body he shall pronounce that person clean. Since it had all turned white, he is clean. But whenever raw flesh appears on him, he will be unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. He has an infectious disease. Should the raw flesh change and run, turn white, he must go to the priest the priest is to examine and admit the sword has turned white. The priest shall pronounce the infected person clean. Then he will be clean. When someone has a boil on his skin and it heals, and in the place where the boil was, a white swelling or reddish white spot appears, he must present himself to the priest. And the priest is to examine it. And if it appears to be more then skin deep and the hair in it has turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. If it is an infectious skin disease that has broken out where the boil was, but if when the priest examines it, there is no white hair in it and it is not moved more than skin deep and has faded, then the priest is to put him in isolation for seven days. If it is spreading in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is infectious. But if the spot is changed and has not spread, it is only a scar from the boil. And the priest shall pronounce him clean. When someone has a burn on his skin and a reddish white or white spot appears in the raw flesh of, of the burn, the priest is to examine the spot, and if the hair it, in it has turned white, and it appears to be more than skin deep, it is an infectious disease that has broken out in the burn. The priest shall examine it, and there is no white hair in the spot, and it is not more than skin deep and has faded, then the priest is to put him in isolation for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest to examine him again, and if it is spread in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It, 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 it is an infectious skin disease. If, however, the spot is unclean, I'm, I'm sorry, if the spot is unchanged and is not spread in the skin but has faded, it is a swelling from the burn, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scar from the burn. If a man or a woman has a sore on his head, or the chin, the priest is to examine the sore, and if it appears to be more than skin deep and the hair is in yellow, in it is yellow and thin, the priest shall pronounce the person unclean. It is an, an it, an infectious disease of the head and chin. But if when the priest examines this kind of sore, it does not seem to be more than skin deep, and there is no black hair in it, 
Then the priest is to put the infectious person in isolation and the itching has not spread and there is no yellow hair in it and it does not appear to be more than skin deep. He must be shaved except for the diseased area and the priest is to keep him in isolation of seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine the itch and if it has not spread in the skin and appears to, to be more, no more than skin deep, the priest shall pronounce him clean. He must wash his clothes and he will be clean. But if the itch does not spread in the skin after he, he is pronounced clean, the priest is to examine him and if the itch has spread in the skin, the priest does not need to look for yellow hair. The person is unclean. If however, in his judgment, it is unchanged and black hair has grown in it and the itch is healed, he is clean and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Kind of reminds me of Infantago. When a man or a woman has white spots on their, on their skin, the priest is to examine them. And if the spot was are dull white, it is a harmless rash that has broken out on the skin that person is clean. When a man has lost his hair and is bald, he is clean. If he has lost his hair from the front of his scalp, and has a bald forehead, he is clean. But if he has a red, reddish white sore on his bald head or forehead, it is an infectious disease breaking out on his head or forehead. The priest is to examine him, and if the swollen area on his head or forehead is reddish, white like a infectious skin disease, the man is diseased and is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him unclean because of the sore on his head. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes. Let them hair be unkept over the lower part of his face and cry out unclean, unclean. As, as long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Regulations about mildew. If any clothing is contaminated with mildew, any wool or linen clothing, any wool woven or knitted material of linen or wool, any leather, anything, made of leather and if that contamination in the cloth clothing or leather or woven or knitted material or any leather uh, leather article is greenish or reddish it is spreading mildew and must be uh, shown to the priest the priest is to examine the mildew and isolate the affected articles for seven days on the seventh day, he is to, to examine it, and it, if the mildew has spread in the cloth or in the woven or knitted material or the leather, whatever it used, it is a destructive mildew, and the article is unclean. He must burn up the clothing or the woven or knitted material or the wooden lint, wool or linen or any leather article that has contaminated it has it in it. Because the mildew is destructive, the article must be burned up. But if when the priest examines it and the mildew has not spread in the cloth or in the woven material or leather article, he shall order that the contaminated article be washed. Then he, he is to isolate it for another seven days. After the affected, affected article has been washed, the priest is to examine it. And if the mildew has not changed its appearance, even though it had not spread, it is unclean. Burn it with fire, whether the mildew has affected one side or the other. <coughs> Excuse me. 
if when the priest examines it, the mildew has faded after the article has been washed, he is to tear, tear the contaminated part out of the cloth or the leather or the woolen or knitted material. But if it reappears in the clothing or in the woven knitted material or in the leather article, it is spreading and whenever it has mildew must be burned with fire. The cloth and woven knitting materials or any leather article that has been washed and is rid of the mildew must be washed again and it will be clean. These are the regulations concerning contamination by mildew and wood, linen, cloth, wool, woven or knitted materials or any leather article for pronouncing them clean or unclean. Chapter 14, from infectious disease, from cleaning from infectious skin diseases. The Lord said to Moses, these are the regulations for the diseased person at the time of his ceremonial cleaning. When he is brought to the priest, the priest is to go outside the camp and examine him. If the portion of has been healed of his infectious skin disease, the priest shall order that the two live clean birds and some other cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop be brought for one to be clean. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over flesh, fresh water in a clay pot. He then is to take the live bird and dip it together with the, with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the flesh, fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed and the other infectious diseases and pronounce him clean. Then he is to release the live bird in an open field. The person to be cleansed must wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe with water. Then he will be ceremonially clean. After this, he may come into the camp, but he must stay outside the tent for seven days. On the seventh day, he must shave off all the hair he must shave his head, his beard, his eyebrows, and all the rest of his hair. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water, and he will be clean. On the eighth day, he must bring two male lambs, one EU lamb and a year old, each without defect, along with three tenths of an ephod of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and one log of oil. The priest who pronounced him clean shall present both the one to be clean and his offering before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meetings. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering along with the log of oil. He shall wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He is to slaughter the lamb in the holy place where the sin offering and the burnt offerings are slaughtered, like the sin offering and the guilt offering belongs to the priest that is most holy. The priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the, on, on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall then take some of the oil, log oil, and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. Dip his right forefinger into the oil in his palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. The priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm of the on the lobe of his right ear and one on the cleanse on his thumb of his right hand and on his on the big toe of his right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering the rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put 
on the head of the one to be cleansed and make atonement for him before the Lord. Then the priest is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. After that, the priest is to slaughter the burnt offering, the offering it to the altar together with the grain offering and make atonement for him and he will be clean. If, however, he is poor and cannot afford these, he must take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him. Together with a tenth of the ephah, the fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, a lot, a log of oil, and two turtle doves and two young pigeons, which he can afford, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. On the eighth day, he must bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. And the priest is to take the lamb for a guilt offering together with the log of oil and wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He shall slaughter the lamb for a guilt offering and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of his right ear of the one to be cleansed on his thumb and on his right hand, on his big toe of his right foot. The priest is to pour some of the oil in the palm of his own left hand and with his right forefinger, sprinkle some of the oil from his palm seven times before the Lord. Some of the oil in his palm, he is to put on the self, on the same place he put the blood of the guilt offering on the lobe of the right ear and one on the be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The rest of the oil in his palm, the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. Then he shall sacrifice the dove or the young pigeon, which the person can afford. Then he shall sacrifice the dove or the young pigeon which the person can afford one as a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering together with the grain offering in this way the priest will make atonement before the lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed these are the regulations for anyone who has an infectious skin disease and who cannot afford the regular offering for his cleansing Verse 33, cleaning, cleaning from mildew, mildew. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when you enter the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as your possession, and I put a spreaded, spreading mildew in a house in that land, the owner of the house must go and tell the priest, I have seen something that looks like mildew in my house and the priest is to order the house to be empty before he goes in to examine the mildew so that nothing in the house will be pronounced unclean after this the priest is to go in and inspect the house he is to examine the mildew on the walls and if it was or is it made out words it has, has greenish and reddish depressions that appear to be deeper than the surface of the wall. The priest shall go out of the house and the entrance closed up the house for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall return to inspect the house. And if the mildew has spread on the walls, he is to order that the contaminated stones be th thrown out and torn, thrown into an unclean place outside the town. He must have all the inside walls of the house scraped and the material that is scraped off, dumped into an unclean place outside the town. Then they are to take other stones to replace these and take new clay and plaster the house. 
if the mildew reappears in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house was scraped and plastered, the priest is to go in and examine it. And if the mildew has spread in the house, it is a destructive mildew and the house is unclean. It must be torn down. It's stones, timbers, and all the plaster taken out of the town to an unclean place. Anyone who goes into the house while it is closed up will be considered unclean till the evening. Anyone who sleeps or eats in the house must be must wash his clothes. But if the priest comes to examine it and the mildew has not spread after the house has been plastered, he shall pronounce the house clean because the mildew is gone. To purify the house, he is to take two birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop. He shall kill one of the birds over, over fresh water in a clay pot. Then he is to take the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet yarn, and the, and the live bird and dip them in the blood of the dead bird and the fresh water and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall purify the house with the bird's blood and the fresh water and the live bird and the cedar and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn. Then he is to re release the live bird in the open field outside the town. And this way he will atone for the house and it will be cleaned or clean. These are the regulations for an infectious skin disease, for itching, for mildew in, cl in clothing or in, or in the house, and for swelling, rashes, and bright spots to determine whether something is clean or unclean. These are the regulations for infectious skin diseases and mildew. Chapter 15, discharges causing uncleanness. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any man has a bloody discharge and the discharge is unclean, whether it continues flowing from his body or is blocked, it will make him unclean. This is how this discharge will bring about uncleanness. Any bed that man was any bed the man with a discharge lies on will be unclean, and anything he sits on will be considered unclean. Anyone who touches his bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water. He will be unclean till evening. Whoever sits on anything that the man with a discharge sat on must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean until the evening. Whoever touches the man who has discharged must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be clean until the evening. If the man with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, that person must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean until the evening. Everything the man sits on when he rides will be unclean. And whoever touches any of the things that were under him will be unclean till the evening. Whoever picks up those things must wash his clothes and bathe in water, and he will be unclean till the evening. Anyone the man with a discharge touches without rinsing his hands with water must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till the evening. A clay pot that the man touches must be broken. Any wood article is to be rinsed with water. When a man is clean, uh, cleaned from his discharge, he is to count off seven days for his ceremonial cleaning. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water. He will be clean. On the eighth day, he must take two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meetings and give them to the priest 
and the priest is to sacrifice them, the one for a sin offering and the other for the burnt offering. In this way, he will make atonement before the Lord for the man because of his discharge. When a man has an emission of semen, he must bathe his whole body with water. He must eat and he will be unclean till evening. Any clothing or leather that has semen on it must be washed with water. It will be unclean till evening. When a man lies with a woman and there is an emission of semen, both must bathe with water and they will be unclean till evening. When a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impure purity of her monthly period will last seven days and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean and anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches her fed must wash his clothes and bathe with water and he will be unclean till the evening. Whoever touches anything she sits on must wash his clothes and bathe with water and he will be unclean till the evening. Whether it is the bed of anything she was, sit, was sitting on, when she, anyone touched it, he must be unclean till the evening. If a man lies with her and her monthly flow touches him, he will be unclean for seven days. Any bed he lies on will be unclean. When a woman has a discharge of blood for, for many days at a time, other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as the day of her period. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be considered unclean as it is her bed during her monthly period. Anything she sits on will be unclean as her during her period. Whoever touches her then will be unclean. He must wash his clothes and bathe his water and he will be unclean till the evening. When she is unclean from, from her discharge, she must count seven days. And after that, she will be ceremonially clean. When she is clean from her discharge, she must count seven days after she has been murdered. On the eighth day, she must take two turtle doves and a young pigeon and bring them to the priest at the entrance of the meeting. And the priest is to sacrifice the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. In this way, he will make atonement for her before the Lord for unclean on her discharge. You must keep this Israelite separate from things that make these unclean so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. These are the regulations for a man with a discharge. For any made, for anyone made unclean by an emission of semen, for a woman in her monthly period, for a man or a woman with a discharge, for a man who lies with a woman who is ceremonially unclean. Wow. Okay, Dave, back at you. Well, thank you, Wes. You know, there's a... Uh... There's a reason that God uh, gave Israel these uh, cleanliness laws um, so that, uh, you know, they could uh, avoid disease and prevent disease from spreading. And, of course, mankind, as uh, 
as typical for mankind, thumbed their nose at God and decided they'll, they'll do things the way they see fit. And, uh, you know, we have disease epidemics all over the place as a result because we don't practice proper quarantine policies. But uh, one day we won't have to worry about that. So if you'll please stand one more time and open your hymnals to page 9. We'll sing our third hymn, which comes from Psalm 9, titled, Declare His Works to All Nations, after which I'll be back with the main message, which is part one of a study regarding the, you know, Passover and the gods of Egypt. So we'll cover the first part today, and then uh, the second part we'll cover on Thursday. So uh, page 9, Declare His Works to All Nations. Okay, if you'll please be seated, we'll now have the main message, which, as I said, is uh, a study regarding the Passover and the gods of Egypt. And uh, I think most of us are familiar with the story of the Exodus. You know, we're here in these days of Passover reflecting on the events of that time and uh, reviewing, um, you know, what those days meant with uh, converted and unconverted alike and how the children came out of Egypt. But, of course, this only occurred after the plagues Yehovah brought upon the Egyptians and unfortunately for the Israelites, they had to suffer some of those plagues as well. These plagues struck at the very heart of the Egyptian socioeconomic system. And their gods, which were the center of that system, were under direct attack uh, by Yehovah. Uh, for the purpose of demonstrating the fact that he alone is God. He alone is the creator. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of this universe. And there is no other God besides him. 
If you look at Exodus 3, 19 through 20, it says, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So God told Moses that he would be the instrument of God's deliverance to the, the children of Israel. And Moses was forewarned by God that Pharaoh would be stubborn and not let the people go until he had proven uh, to Pharaoh that he alone was the only God. The ten plagues were not just against Pharaoh and his people, but against all the gods of Egypt, as we read. In Numbers 33, 3 and 4, it says, They set out from Ramesses in the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month. On the day after Passover, the people of Israel went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians, while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom Jehovah had struck down among them. On their gods also Jehovah executed judgments. Right? So these judgments were for a purpose. And the purpose was to not only display his mighty power, but to to prove that he alone is God and that these Egyptian gods um, were completely powerless and useless. And the first three plagues were directed against the Egyptian gods of water. And the first plague was when the water was changed to blood. I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay, so hopefully we're all right. In Exodus 7, 14 through 25, Exodus 7, 14 through 25, it says, Then Yehovah said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refused to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him. And take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, Yehovah, the Elohim of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says Yehovah, by this, right, another key, by this you shall know that I am Yehovah. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And Yehovah said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as Jehovah commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish of the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as Jehovah had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after Yehovah had struck the Nile. Now, the Nile River was the lifeline of Egypt. All the trade and commerce and crops depended on the, on the Nile. And this river reaches flood stages in um, right around the June time frame as a result of heavy summer rains in the Ethiopian highlands. Now the first signs of the annual inundation are seen in Upper Egypt 
at Aswan by the end of June, and the flooding reached its fullest at Memphis in Lower Egypt by September. Now, in uh, the work Exodus, Youngblood says that the word blood can be understood either as literal blood or metaphorically as blood red, that is, the color of blood. In either case, the fish in the Nile would die. So it appears that the Egyptians were able to find clean water, right, by digging along the banks of the Nile, as we read. And if the water were really turned into actual blood, um, I don't think that, uh, that uh, they would have found clean water by digging in the bank of the Nile. Um, in uh, the IVP Bible background commentary, Old Testament, um, by Walton Matthews and Chevalis, it says this, it says either the red clay washed down from Ethiopia, which caused the annual phenomenon still called the Red Nile by the Arabs, or the multiplication of red plankton as at, the, uh, at times off the Queens, Queensland coast would seem to be the best explanation. The blood coloring the blood red coloring, uh, sorry, that was from Exodus and Introduction and Commentary by Cole. Um, this next quote by Walton Matthews and Chevalis in uh, the Bible background commentary says, the blood red coloring has been attributed to an excess of both red earth and the bright red algae and its bacteria, both of which accompany a heavier than usual flooding. Rather than the abundant life usually brought by the river, this brought death to the fish and detriment to the soil. Such an occurrence is paralleled in an observation in the admonitions of uh, Epure a few centuries before Moses that the Nile had turned to blood and was undrinkable. The biblical comment about the Egyptians digging down in verse 24 would be explained as an attempt to reach water that had been filtered through the soil. So they were getting clean water by digging uh, down into the soil, uh, which, as we know, does filter the water. Um, in the Bible knowledge word study, Genesis and Deut to Deuteronomy, J Johnston states, some scholars attempt to explain the Nile turning blood red in the light of natural phenomena that occur periodically in the Nile Valley. Unusually heavy rainfall washed an unusual amount of red sediment into the Nile, giving the water a red hue. To view this in light of natural phenomenon does not diminish divine involvement in the plagues. From a theological perspective, this would be a matter of God harnessing the forces of nature to accomplish his purpose. This was an act of poetic justice. The Egyptians killed Hebrew infants by casting them into the Nile. So Yehovah, or he says Yahweh, would figuratively strike the Nile in return, turning it blood red as an ominous object lesson of coming judgment. So not only was the Nile red, but other waters as well said that the, the canals and the ponds and stuff and even the water that was drawn uh, for use in houses in stone or wooden jars was turned red. Um, in, in Philo's work, Moses, it says, The brother of Moses, by the divine command, smote with his rod upon the river, and immediately throughout its whole course, from Ethiopia down to the sea, it is changed into blood, and simultaneously with its change, all the lakes and ditches and fountains and wells and spring and every particle of water in all Egypt was changed into blood so that for want of drink they digged around um, about the banks of, of the river but the streams that came up were like veins of the body in a hemorrhage and spurted up channels of blood like springs no transparent water being seen anywhere. Now that's according to Philo. So, you know, was it blood? Was it not blood? Uh, we don't know for sure. Um, 
but in scripture it seems to indicate that they were digging to find water it doesn't necessarily state that they did but at any rate it was uh, it was a pretty terrible time for them to say the least so this plague was an affront to many of the greatest gods of Egypt uh, a god named Happy or or Hep or Hap, the god of the annual Nile inundation, was quote unquote the spirit of the Nile, and uh, its dynamic essence uh, in Egyptian belief. Epithets describe him as being the lord of the fishes and birds and marshes. Um, uh, in ancient Egyptian myths and legends, pages 169 to 170, Spence says the following, this deity was especially connected with the great river whence Egypt drew her sustenance, and as such was a god of very considerable importance in the Egyptian pantheon. The entire country looked to the Nile as the source of all wealth and provender, so that the de deity which presided over it rapidly rose in public estimation. Thus, Happy quickly became identified with the greater and more outstanding figures in earlier or in early Egyptian mythology. He thus became a partner with the great original gods who had created the world and finally came to be regarded as the maker and molder of everything within the universe. We find him credited with the attributes of Nu, the primeval water mass, and this, uh, in effect, made him a father of Ra, who had emerged from that element. Happy indeed stood in more immediate relationship to the Egyptians than almost any other god in their pantheon. Without the sun, Egypt would have been plunged into darkness, but without the Nile, every living creature within the borders would assuredly have perished. So this is this god Happy was one of their most prominent figures. Although Osiris, and this is from uh, the work Ancient Egypt by Silverman on page 19, he says, although Osiris ordained the annual inundation, the god most associated with the river itself was Happy depicted as a human figure with a large belly and pendulous breasts. This corpulence represented the bounties of the Nile, whose waters flowed to nurture Egypt. Hymns addressed to the Nile spoke of its bounty, expressing joy at its coming and sorrow at the plight of Egypt when the Nile floods failed. The inundation was ritually greeted with thanks and jubilation in honor of Happy, its patron divinity. And in the IBP Bible Background Commentary, Old Testament, page 82, Walton, Matthews, and Chevalis state, the Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. Agriculture and ultimately survival were dependent on the periodic flooding that deposited fertile soils along the river's 4,132 miles. The obese Happy, one of the children of Horus, was technically not the god of the Nile, but the personification of the inundation of the Nile. The blood red coloring has been attributed to an excess of both red earth and bright red algae and its bacteria, both of which accompany a heavier than usual flooding. Rather than the abundant life usually brought by the river, this brought death to the fish and detriment to the soil. We read that a little bit earlier. So Happy was one of the gods that uh, was uh, being addressed in this play. Uh, there's another god, his name is Khnum, or Num. Uh, he was the guardian of the Nile and creator of water and life. Now Khnum uh, is represented as a human being with a ram's head. In Silverman's work, Ancient Egypt, on page 19, he says, At the fount of Egypt's fertility, the supposed source of the Nile was linked to the ram-headed creator god Hnum, 
who uh, was believed to have fashioned humankind from Nile mud in a, on a potter's wheel. It's interesting the parallels we find between some of these myths and uh, what we find in scripture. One of the greatest gods of Egypt was Osiris, the god of the underworld. He held the same position that Ra did in the land of the living. The Egyptians believed that the Nile was actually his bloodstream. In the work, The History of the Ancient World by Bauer, on page 236, it says the exodus of the Hebrews was a nose-thumbing directed not just at the power of the Pharaoh and his court, but at the power of the Egyptian gods themselves. The plagues were designed to ram home the impotence of the Egyptian pantheon. The Nile, the bloodstream of Osiris, and the lifeblood of Egypt was turned to blood and became foul and poisonous. Frogs, sacred to Osiris, appeared in numbers so great they were transformed into a pestilence. The sun disk was blotted out by darkness. Ra and Aten uh, both made helpless. And um, in Silverman's Ancient Egypt, he says, according to allusions in early religious texts, the later literary and artistic references, Osiris taught the people how to take advantage of the Nile by giving them the arts of cultivation. Now, uh, there's another god, Sothis, or Sopdet, was the goddess who was... Uh, heralded as the bringer of the annual inundation of the Nile River and of the new year. She was associated with the prosperity that came from the fertile soil left by the receding Nile. Um, in Moses and the Gods of Egypt by Davis on page 102, it says, it was appropriate that the first of the plague should be directed against the Nile River itself the very lifeline of Egypt and the center of many of its religious ideas. The Nile was considered sacred by the Egyptians. Many of their gods were associated either directly or indirectly with this river and its productivity. For example, the great Khnum, the god Khnum, uh, was considered the guardian of the Nile sources. Happy was believed, uh, or happy was believed to be the spirit of the Nile and its dynamic essence. One of the greatest gods revered in Egypt was the god Osiris, who was the god of the underworld. The Egyptians believed that the river Nile was his bloodstream. In the light of this latter expression, it is appropriate indeed that the Lord should turn the Nile to blood. It is not only said that the fish of the river died, but that the river stank and the Egyptians were not uh, we're not able to use the water of that river. Imagine the horror and frustration of the people of Egypt as they looked upon that which was formerly beautiful only to find dead fish lining the shores and an ugly red characterizing what had before provided life and attraction. Crocodiles were forced to leave the Nile. One wonders what worshippers would have thought of Happy, the god of the Nile, who was sometimes manifest in the crocodile. Right, so it was a direct affront. This first plague was a direct affront of, uh, of these gods. So now... Um, we move on to the second plague, which is the plague of frogs. We can read about that in Exodus 8, 1 through 15, where it says, Then Yehovah said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says uh, Yehovah, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs and shall come, uh, shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. 
the frogs shall come up on you and on your people and all your servants. And Yehovah said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came by and covered the land of Egypt. So, you know, we've got all these frogs coming up. And uh, they're, they're just, they're basically everywhere in, in everything. Uh, verse 7, But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with Yehovah to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to Yehovah. Uh, Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like Yehovah, our Elohim. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to Yehovah about the frogs, as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And Yehovah did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as Jehovah had said. So one week after uh, Jehovah struck the Nile from Exodus 7.25, Moses went back to Pharaoh to demand the release of God's people. The presence of the frogs um, wouldn't you know, be that unusual, um, as the receding Nile would have left ponds and, and standing water, which would have been natural breeding grounds uh, for these frogs. And in normal years, an abundance of frogs would be considered a blessing since they helped to control the insect population. This plague goes beyond the Nile, right, and into the houses, the bedrooms, the kitchens, the ovens, and all of that of the people as the frogs were abandoning the polluted Nile, right? It turned to blood, and they would have come out of there. Uh, the number of frogs was beyond any logical explanation. They didn't just leave the Nile, but they covered the land of Egypt, according to Exodus 8.6. In his work called Exodus, um, page 206, Stuart says, What was actually threatened was the ugliness of having slimy, unsanitary, unpleasant to the touch amphibians everywhere, and the constant annoyance of having to listen to them croak and peep throughout all parts of the people's houses. Implied is the disgust that would occur when people stepped on the frogs you know, as far as we know, Egyptians did not wear shoes indoors. When they rolled over on them in bed, again, you know, people slept on mats on the floor, not in elevated beds as, you know, we tend to think of it. And uh, when they were surprised by them in various places throughout uh, or thought otherwise to be clean. And in Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible, uh, he says on page 101, in various parts of the East, instead of what we call ovens, they dig a hole in the ground in which they insert a kind of earthen pot, which having sufficiently heated, they stick their cakes onto the inside, and when baked, remove them and supply their places uh, with others, and so on. To find such places full of frogs when they came to heat them in order to make their bread must be both disgusting and distressing in the extreme. Now, Pharaoh's magicians couldn't remove the plague. They only added to the number of frogs that were invading the land. 
and Moses allowed Pharaoh to determine when the frogs would be removed, thus proving that their removal was not by chance or some other natural process, right? He said, you tell me when you want them removed so that you can, we can prove to you that our God is God. And he said, do it tomorrow. So who were the gods affected by this, uh, this plague? Which gods were being uh, judged at this point? The frog was considered the theophany of the goddess uh, Hecat, or Hect. Um, Hecat, the wife of the creator of the world and the goddess of childbirth. Hecat was always shown with the head of a frog. Amulets and scarabs worn by women to protect them during childbirth would bear, uh, would often bear the image of Hecat uh, for protection. And Hecat was believed to assist women in childbirth. Just consider, right, how ironic it must have been in the statement that the frogs invaded Pharaoh's bedroom and even jumped on his bed, since, you know, Hecat was the believed to assist women in childbirth. In uh, Mercatante, um, or who's who in Egyptian mythology, Mercatante says on page 55, since the frog was seen in great numbers a day or two before the rise of the Nile, it was regarded as a symbol of new life and prolific generation. A frog amulet, sometimes a frog at the end of a phallus, was carried by Egyptians to guarantee fertility. Variant spellings of Hecate, um, you know, they spell it with a K or a Q, and so it's spelled different ways. The main cultic center for Hecate was at Herwer, and remains of a temple of the goddess have been found at Kus. Uh, the people of the land had to gather the decaying bodies of the frogs and put them into heaps, as we read. And in his work on the reliability of the Old Testament, page 253, Kitchen states that frogs were the symbol of abundance, hence of prosperity, personified as Hecate, but here again they brought death, right? So it's, an, it's a direct affront to, to uh, their, their gods. And, uh, and it continues. On into the third plague. So, you know, the fact that Pharaoh entreated Moses to intercede with Jehovah to take away the frogs was a sign that you know, he was starting to recognize uh, the, that Yehovah was the author of that plague. You know, it's starting to dawn on him that, you know, there might be something to this. So now we move into the third plague of lice. And we see that in Exodus 8, 16 through 19. Where it says, Then Yehovah said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried... Uh, by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as Jehovah had said. Now bear in mind that the Israelites were enduring these first three plagues as well. So they're right in the midst of it. And uh, while we, you know, we don't really know how long these plagues lasted necessarily, we do know a few things for sure. 
Uh, first, the Bible says in Exodus 7:7 7, 7, that Moses was 80 years old when the ten plagues started. After he spoke to Pharaoh. After the plagues were done and Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then Moses died at the end of the 40 years at the age of 120. So by simple deduction, um, if Moses was 80 at the start, wandered 40 years, and died at 120, the plagues had to have ended in under a year. So it had to be less than a year's time that these plagues happened, right? Now, we sometimes we tend to think that it just happened bang, 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 bang. But that may not be the case. And while some scholars believe the plagues may have lasted up to a year, um, I think that some of the Jewish uh, commentators state that, um, we know that it had to be less than that based on uh, Moses' age. So... Uh, It's, it's, uh, it's more likely, and, and many believe that they lasted somewhere between four to five months. Now, if we assume for the moment that it was around four to five months um, as a length of time that these, through which these plagues occurred, uh, that would put us in late fall um, in the land of Goshen there, um, and the fields are still flooded by the receding waters of the Nile. Now, this plague was inflicted without any warning given to, to Pharaoh. Right? He, he wasn't warned ahead of time. It just happened. Uh, the word lice is the Hebrew word kenim, um, and in the New King James Version is translated as sand flies or fleas or mosquitoes in other translations. The Hebrew word kenim comes from a root word meaning to dig. And it's probable that the insect in question would dig under the skin, almost like a chigger. If you're, you know, have spent any time in the South, you know what a chigger is, and they're very unpleasant. Um, in the IBP Bible background commentary, Old Testament, it says the type of insect. Um, NIV has it as gnats. Involved in this plague is not clear since the Hebrew word is used only in this context. Most studies have favored either the mosquito or the tick as the likeliest identification. Um, in his work, Israel in Egypt, uh, on page 146, Hoffmeyer states, the identity of the insect, Kenim, involved in the third plague has been disputed by scholars. Nats is a common translation, the RSV, NAS, and the NIV, while lice is also suggested from the KJV. A number of commentators have understood gnats to mean a type of mosquito, an interpretation accepted by the Jerusalem Bible and Hort. The flood season in Egypt always brought with it mosquitoes, that could quickly reproduce in the pools and puddles left by the retreating Nile. And in uh, the work Egyptian Medicine in the Days of the Pharaohs, Ibade says uh, on page 351 to 352, the inundation of the Nile provides breeding places for mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were abundant, according to Herodotus, the fishermen protected themselves. Gnats are abundant. This is how the Egyptians protected themselves against them. Those who dwell higher up uh, than the marshy country are well served by the towers, whether they ascend to sleep, uh, for the winds prevent the gnats from flying aloft. Those living about the marshes have a different device instead of the towers. Every man uh, every man of them has a net with which he catches fish by day, and for the night he sets it uh, round the bed where he rests, then creeps under it, uh, and so sleeps. If he sleeps wrapped in a garment of cloth, or a garment or cloth, the gnats bite through it, but through the net uh, they do not even try at all to bite. 
So they had these different ways of dealing with this problem of gnats, which was a natural occurrence in the, around the Nile, especially as the waters receded and it left the, uh, um, the uh, pools where they could breed, like you know mosquitoes do in stagnant water. And Philo, in his work titled Moses, says, And that little animal, even though it is very small, is exceedingly annoying, for not only does it spoil the appearance, creating unseemly and injurious itchings, but it also penetrates into the inmost parts, entering in at the nostrils and ears. And it flies into the eyes and injures the pupils, unless one takes great care. And what care could be taken against so extensive a plague, especially when it was God who was inflicting the punishment? So, you know, it's, it's in, in all likelihood it was a mosquito um, that was um, the animal being referred to here, or the insect being referred to here, and it seems to make the most sense, especially given the fact that their major enemy, the frog, had largely been destroyed uh, at the end of the prior plague. So the, you know, the, the frogs feed on the mosquitoes and their larvae and those frogs were destroyed. So now they were running amok. So which gods of Egypt were affected by this particular plague? Um, this certainly would have been an embarrassment to Geb the great god of the earth and head of the divine tribunal of, on the kingship. Egyptians have, or they gave offerings to Geb uh, for a, the bounty of the soil. In Wilkinson's work, The Complete Gods and Goddesses of the Ancient Egypt, on page 105, he says, he was also the source of fresh waters and ultimately all of the earth produced so that uh, all that the earth produced so that Geb was directly associated with the fertility of both the earth and livestock. So this plague would have been especially dreadful to the priests of Egypt for they were required to shave their hair off every day and wear a single tunic that no lice would be permitted on their bodies. Uh, the daily ritual of the priest wouldn't be possible because of, uh, of the physical impurity that they had because of all these insects. In uh, the Age of Gods, or the Age of God, Kings, on page 72, Flaherty states that though priests often performed important secular tasks, as illustrated by the architectural feats of Imhotep, their sacred duties set them apart from the rest of the population and they bore marks of exclusivity. Throughout the land, circumcised priests shaved off all body hair, including eyebrows and lashes, and they conducted their rites cloaked in white garments and animal skins. And in Herodotus's work, uh, The Histories on page 99, he says, the priests shave their bodies all over every other day to guard against the presence of lice or anything else equally unpleasant while they are about their religious duties. The priests, too, wear linen only and shoes made from the papyrus plant, these materials for dress and shoes being the only ones allowed them. They bathe in cold water twice a day and twice every night and observe innumerable other ceremonies besides. And then Spence, in his work, Ancient Egyptian Myths and Legends, on page 53, says, The duties of the priesthood were arduous. The most stringent and exacting code had to be followed so far as cleanliness and discipline were concerned. Constant purifications and lustrations succeeded each other. And the garb of the religious must be fresh and unspotted. It consisted entirely of the purest and whitest linen, the wearing of woolen and other fabrics being strictly forbidden and even abhorred. The head was closely shaven and no headdress was worn. The priest's day was thoroughly mapped out for him. And then in the Complete Temples of Ancient Egypt, on page 90 to 91, Wilkinson says, 
For priests in active service, strict standards of purity were maintained. These stipulations varied in different cults, but by New Kingdom and later times, they usually required priests to shave their heads and bodies, pare their nails, uh, perform multiple daily washings and lustrations, according to Herodotus, twice each day and twice each night, um, to sexual intercourse rendered them unclean until purif purified. Uh, the eating of any ritually proscribed foods during the period of service was shunned, as was any other behavior which might be taboo in the service of a specific deity. So, by the end of the third plague, right, the magicians in Pharaoh's court had been forced to admit that they could not compete with Moses and his God, right? They said, they told Pharaoh that, you know, surely this is the work of God. And through these three terrible plagues, the gods of Egypt had no answer. They remained silent, right? So there was no response from these supposed gods. And as we know, the worst was yet to come. So these gods were silent. So the first three plagues affected the uh, entire land of Egypt, but beginning with the fourth plague, God made a distinction between his people and the native Egyptians. So this is where God sets apart the Israelites from Egypt. And, you know, three uh, is a representation or a number of completion, and it also is a a a, a number of, of that speaks to spirituality, right? It's it's a spiritual number. You know, Christ was in the grave three days and three nights, and he rose. You know, so the number three, of course, they've created the Holy Trinity, but uh, we know that that's um, probably came from Babylon itself. which was influenced by Nimrod. So in uh, Edersheim's The Bible History of the Old Testament, uh, he says, and now in the second series of plagues commenced the distinction between the Egyptians and Israel, the latter being exempted from the strokes to show that it was not the finger of Elohim merely but that he was Yehovah in the midst of the land, right? Uh, in the midst of the land of Egypt. For the same reason, Moses and Aaron were not used as instruments in the fourth and fifth plagues. They were simply announced to Pharaoh by the messengers of Yehovah, but inflicted by God himself to show that they came directly from his hand. It's an interesting insight. Um, so the fourth plague was, were the swarms. And you can see that in Exodus 8, 20 through 32, where it says, Then Yehovah said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says Yehovah, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there that you may know that I am Yehovah in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen, and Yehovah did so. There shall come, or there came, great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, 
go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to Jehovah our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to Jehovah our Elohim as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to Jehovah your Elohim in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with Jehovah that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to Jehovah. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to Jehovah. And Jehovah said, as, or did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Right? So he's still holding on to this stubbornness. And as the waters of the Nile had started to recede, as we've discussed, it left behind these pools of stagnant water. And of course, you have these piles of dead frogs as well. So there's a, there's a lot going on um, at this point in time. And Moses doesn't use the word flies in this passage. He used the word swarms. And there is no accompanying noun to indicate uh, what kind of a swarm it was. The phrase of flies was added by translators in most of the English translations that we use. In the Jewish Publication Society, uh, in their commentary on Exodus 8.21, it says, If flies is the intent of the text, then they would have had a lot to feed on, since there were piles of dead frogs everywhere. The translation published by the Jewish Publication Society uses the phrase, swarms of insects. And Young's literal translation reads, If thou art not sending my people away, lo, I am sending against thee, and against thy servants, and against thy people, and against thy houses, the beetle. And the houses of the Egyptians have been full of the beetle, and also the ground on which they are. Now, most scholars... I think, believe that uh, this swarm was a blood-sucking dogfly, which was reproduced or responsible for a lot of the blindness in that land. So this dogfly apparently can cause blindness. Um, in his work, Exodus and Introduction and Commentary, on page 100, Cole states the following. The Septuagint translates the word Kainomuya, uh, literally dogfly. This, to judge from the description, corresponds to the mo modern gadfly or marchfly with a painful bite. Now, uh, Kiel and Delich also believe uh, that this was a dogfly, and you can see that in their commentary of the Old Testament, or on the Old Testament. Uh, on Exodus 8:20 through32, where and then uh, over in, in uh, Philo in his work Moses, he says, "The first is that which was inflicted by means of that animal, which is the boldest in all nature, namely the dog fly, or kinumia, uh, which those person who invent names, have named with great propriety, for they were wise men, combining the name of the appellation of the most impudent of all animals, a fly, and a dog, the one being the boldest of all terrestrial, and the other the boldest of all flying animals. 
for they approach and run up fearlessly, and if anyone drives them away, they still resist and renew their attack, so as never to yield until they are sated with blood and flesh. And so the dogfly, having derived boldness from both these animals, is a biting and treacherous creature, for it shoots in from a distance with a whizzing sound like an arrow, and then, and when it has reached its mark, it sticks very closely with great force. So this, um, in the work Exodus, on uh, page 42, Sarna states, this would be the stable fly, or uh, stomoxis, uh, calcitrins, uh, a vicious blood-sucking insect that can <coughs> multiply prodigiously, <coughs> excuse me, in tropical and subtropical regions. Given the proper environmental conditions, it is known to transmit anthrax and other animal diseases. And in that same work, Kaiser actually says, this fly multiplies rapidly in tropical and subtropical regions, hence the delta with its Mediterranean climate would be exempt. In the fall, by laying its 600 to 800 eggs in dung or rotting plant debris, when it is full grown, the fly prefers to infest houses and stables, and it bites both men and animals, usually in the lower extremities. Thus it becomes the principal transmitter of skin anthrax, um, which it contracts by crawling over the carcasses of animals that have died of internal anthrax. Um, and he makes a reference to Plague 6 in that work. And Durham states in that same work on page 114 that they are clearly regarded as a miracle of Yahweh both by the, sudden, the suddenness of their arrival and by their endless number and also by the equal suddenness and completeness of their departure. So similarly, their absence from the land of Goshen where Yahweh's people are is regarded as miraculous. Right? So... That's what the commentators have to say about this, this swarm. It appears to be the dog fly, which has a very painful bite. So, uh, what gods of Egypt were impacted by this plague? They are more, a little bit more difficult to identify than in the previous plagues, but according to some scholars, there are basically two possibilities. Kepri and Re, um, in addition to the gods of healing that we will discuss in the sixth play. Now, Kepri, or Keper, uh, was usually depicted as a scarab or dung beetle, and often pushing a solar disk. Kepri did not have a cult of its own, but was honored in many Egyptian temples, um, and there is a uh, well-preserved statue of Kepri near the sacred lake at the temple of Amun at Karnak. Uh, deification of the scarab beetle is still seen in Egypt today, so it's still, it's still there. Uh, Ra, or Re, uh, the creator, king of the gods and supreme god of the Egyptian pantheon, was often depicted with the head of a beetle. Ra is the Egyptian, uh, the ancient Egyptian word for sun. In uh, Gods and Pharaohs from Egyptian Mythology, on page 24, Harris states the following. Ra, the sole creator, was visible to the people of Egypt as the disk of the sun, but they knew him in many other forms. He could appear as a crowned man, a falcon, or a man with a falcon's head and as the scarab beetle pushes a round ball of dung in front of it, the Egyptians pictured Ra as a scarab pushing the sun across the sky. Now, I don't know why you would want to model your supreme god after a dung beetle, but I guess that's their business. Uh, the scarab was actually a dung beetle, an insect uh, that feeds on dung in the field. Um, it's also possible that this plague um, was um, swarms of scarabs. Um, 
and they have you know the big mandibles that they can use to actually saw through wood and they're extremely destructive and worse than termites so for the first time God made that distinction between his people and the Egyptians and the swarms stayed away from Goshen where the Israelites were and where they lived in Exodus 8, 22 through 23, it says, But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am Yehovah in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And this distinction was made for a reason. What does he say? In order that you may know that I am Yehovah in the midst of the land. He is the only God. In the New American Commentary, Volume 2, page 215, Stuart says the following. Here, God's distinction between his own and those who do not belong to him is shown by his control of nature. Although flies and other swarming insects cannot naturally discriminate by nationality or political boundaries, in deciding on whom they will land and whose skin they will bite, nationality and political boundary was exactly the basis for the plaguing or non-plaguing by the swarms, uh, by the swarming insects. Here then is brought overtly to the reader's attention the fact that the plagues, far from being natural phenomena naturally produced, were nature turned on its head. Nature ordered by its creator to act in abnormal ways that were ominously frightening for the Egyptians, wonderfully reassuring for the Israelites, and clearly evidential in, in, in this plague even to Pharaoh, a divine mighty act in service of a divine demand. And this preferential treatment toward Israel demonstrate very clearly that the plague was against Egypt, right? It was very specifically directed against Egypt. Okay, carrying on now to the fifth plague. We'll, we'll cover the first five plagues today, and then we'll uh, cover the, the last five uh, probably on Thursday. So the fifth plague was uh, regarding the livestock. The livestock were, became diseased. In Exodus 9, 1 through 7. Exodus 9, 1 through 7, it says, Then Yehovah said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says Yehovah, the Elohim of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of Yehovah will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses and the donkeys, the camels, the herds and the flocks. But Yehovah will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. Again, drawing a distinction so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And Yehovah set a time, saying, Tomorrow Yehovah will do this thing in the land. And the next day Yehovah did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So the first four plagues afflicted the people, you know, they were very uncomfortable, um, but it didn't seem to impact their property in any, any major way. But this plague started to impact their livelihood uh, for years to come, right? That livestock was part of their livelihood. This plague was against domestic animals in the land of Egypt, which would include their cattle, their horses, donkeys, camels, oxen, sheep. Um, 
the impact on the economy of the nation would have been catastrophic. You know, this is an agrarian economy. And it appears that the plagues, you know, they're, they're escalating. They're getting progressively worse, you know, because this, this is the first indication we have where Moses calls this a very severe pestilence in Exodus 9.3. In the work Exodus, Wells says the following. One of the words used for plagues in Hebrew is nega. Um, see comments on 11.1. One. The term here is deber. Rather than meaning general calamity or affliction as nega uh, seems to, deber can mean plague in the medieval sense a disease of epidemic proportions that is sure to bring death. And many scholars suggest uh, that this plague was a form of anthrax produced by the bacteria in the Nile, which was infected by dead frogs, fish, and flies. Um, in the work Exodus on page 53, Youngblood states, the flies would have become carriers of the highly infectious and usually fatal uh, Bacillus anthracis uh, that had already killed the fish and frogs and livestock, brought back into the fields uh, as the floodwaters subsided, would have succumbed to the anthrax bacteria. So unlike the other plagues, this one didn't have a set time for its removal. Right? It, it, it appears that it, it at some point just kind of died out. If all the cattle died, how were any left, right? So it kind of indicates or seems that all of the cattle died, um, but how, how would there any have been left to be killed by the hail, which is still coming? In Exodus 9.6, the word for all, which is the Hebrew word kol, uh, can mean all sorts of, or from all over, or all over the place. Uh, and you can compare that to Genesis 24, 10 and 40, verse 17. In addition, Moses had already specified that this plague was only against the livestock which are in the field, in Exodus 9, 3. Not those that were sheltered, at least that's, that's what was said. Um, in the Apologetic Study Bible, uh, Cabal says, if all the Egyptians' livestock were killed in the plague, where did the livestock come from that later died in the hailstorm? In verses 19 through 25. The Bible doesn't explain this. However, two possibilities exist. The first assumption doesn't ex um, The first assumption is that the word all should be taken literally. In that case, the livestock later killed in the hailstorm were imported from farther up the Nile River, perhaps from Cush. Or that in the interval between the plagues, the Egyptians had acquired some of the Israelites' flocks. Alternatively, the word all in verse 6 might be used here in a restrictive sense to mean all that were in a particular area or all who were afflicted or perhaps simply the great majority. And then Kaiser, um, in the work Exodus, states, normally the Egyptian cattle were stabled from May to December inclusive during the flood and the drying off periods when the pastures were waterlogged. Thus, some of the cattle were already being turned out to pasture down south, so it must have been sometime in the month of January. These cattle uh, were then affected when they came into contact with the heaps of dead frogs left from the second plague and died of Bacillus anthracis, the hoof and mouth disease. So that, that's Kaiser's comment, right? But what, which gods of Egypt is Yehovah dealing with in this plague? The Egyptians worshipped uh, all sorts of animals and many animal-headed deities. Um, 
the ancient author Isidore of Seville uh, from circa 560 to 636 stated the following in the fifth place Egypt is struck with the slaughter of animals or cattle frenzy is demonstrated here and the stupidity of men also uh, of men uh, who like irrational um, who like irrational animals gave worship and the name of God to figures carved in wood or stone figures not only of men but of animals too they worshiped Jupiter Ammon in a ram Anubis in a dog and Apis in a bull and others too which Egypt admired as symbols of its gods they believed that the divine splendor was present in these forms and offered pathetic acts of worship to them of worship to them and that's that's quoted in uh, uh, Exodus Leviticus numbers Deuteronomy um, and that work by Leonard Roms and Odin Um, also in uh, the histories by Herodotus, he says, All Egyptians use bulls and bull calves for sacrifice if they have passed the test for cleanness, but they are forbidden to sacrifice heifers on the ground that they are sacred to Isis, right? So these heifers are sacred to Isis, so they can't, they can't sacrifice them. Now, the Apis bull, or bull deity, worshipped in Egypt uh, from around 3000 BC, was a sacred creature of Ptah, and worshipped as his living image. The funerary cult devoted to him left many important remains. Egyptian priests had to find a special black bull one that had a white triangle on his forehead with the hair of its tail divided into two separate strands. He was also associated with Ra, uh, from whom he borrowed the disc he wore between his horns. Right, and this is the Apis bull. When the Apis bull died, priests would travel through every pasture in Egypt looking for his replacement. This Apis bull supposedly had the power of prophecy. When the Apis bull died, the land of Egypt mourned for him as they would for the loss of the monarch himself, right? So he was equal to Pharaoh in that sense. And then after death, his body would be embalmed, and after the funeral rites were performed, the body would be placed in a granite sarcophagus. And they, they've, they've found some of those in the remains and the ruins of Egypt. So, since all of the livestock of Egypt died from Exodus 9 6, if an Apis bull would have been alive at the time, it would have died in this plague, right? So, if this bull was out in the field, it would have died. Um, in his work, Israel in Egypt, Hoffmeyer on page 150 says During the period when the cult of Apis was maintained in Memphis, from circa 1400 BC through the late period, only one special bull was associated with Apis, received special treatment, and was mummified and buried uh, at Saqqara. And then in uh, his work, The Religion of Ancient Egypt, Petri uh, says on pages 22 through 23, the bull was sacred in many places, and his worship underlay that of the human gods, who were said to be incarnated in him. The idea is that the fighting power, as when the king is figured as a bull trampling on his enemies, and the reproductive power, as in the title of the self-renewing god's bull of his mother, the most renowned was the happy or apis bull of Memphis, in whom Ptah was said to be incarnate, and who was Os Osirified and became the Osir Hapi, Right? Another bull of a more massive breed was the Ur-Mur, or Menevis, of Heliopolis, in whom Ra was incarnate. The third bull was Bach, or Bacchus, of uh, Hermonthus, 
uh, the incarnation of Mentu. And a fourth bull, uh, Kanub or Kanobos, was worshipped at the city of that name. The cow was identified with Hathor, who appears with cow's ears and horns, and who is probably the cow goddess Ashtaroth or Istar of Asia. Isis, as identified with Hathor, is also joined in this connection. So Hathor was considered the mother, uh, the mother of Pharaoh and also the sky goddess. She took the form of a cow with a circle between her horns to represent the sun. And Hathor was one of the most important deities in the history of ancient Egypt and was worshipped in many other countries as well. Um, in their commentary on Herodotus, page 185, Howe and Wells state the following. The cow was the living symbol of Isis, or Hathor, Hathor, uh, represented sometimes as a cow, at others as a woman who are with a cow's head, at others as a horned woman. And then Spence says in his Ancient Egyptian Myths and Legends on page 163, the original form under which Hathor was worshipped was that of a cow. Later she represented as a woman with the head of a cow and finally with a human head, the face broad, kindly, placid, and decidedly bovine, sometimes retaining the ears or horns of the animal she represents. She is also shown with a headdress resembling a pair of horns with the moon disc between them. Right, and this is this is where this this these horns um, are what spurred or began, I think, the crescent moon observation. And and Hart in his Egyptian gods and goddesses on page seventy-seven, he says there was clearly a veneration of cow goddesses in pre-dynastic Egypt, but without hieroglyphs, it is impossible to be certain if a cult belongs to Hathor or perhaps to Bat, the most likely candidate for the cow heads on the name uh, the Narmer palette uh, from about 3000 BC. By the beginning of the Old Kingdom, there is an indisputable archaeological and textual proof of the worship of Hathor. The Valley Temple of King Khafre from the, the sixth or the fourth dynasty at Giza was placed in its southern sector under the protection of Hathor. Her temples are mentioned in the Old Kingdom annals on the Palermo stone and royal ladies from the early pyramid age onwards take the title Priestess of Hathor. So she was the symbolic mother of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt was referred to as the son of Hathor. Now, Montu uh, was the protector of kings during times of war, and he took the symbol of an ox and was sometimes pictured as a human being with the head of an ox. And Kanum uh, was represented as a human being with a ram's head. He supposedly created the universe on his potter's wheel. He also shaped the other gods, human beings and animals. On Elephantine Island at Aswan, there was a temple to Khnum for the second time. God made a distinction between his people and the Egyptians. The livestock belonging to the Israelites, as I said, was not affected. Right? So the these, uh, these, this plague on the livestock was a direct affront to all of these gods that took or were embodied by, by animals. Now, Pharaoh sent messengers to see if the Israelites were affected in Exodus 9-7. And since, uh, you know, they were agrarian as well, they were pastoral people, and if their cattle died, it would have financially ruined them, just like the Egyptians. And somehow this distinction that he found managed to 
harden his heart even more. Now, you know, Scripture says that God hardened his heart, but uh, nevertheless, his heart was hardened, and uh, he didn't let the people go. Um, so that puts us at about halfway uh, in the study, and we have five more plagues to go. So I think we'll end it there for today, and then we'll cover the last five um, in uh, the next service. So I think with that, we will now have our final hymn, after which I would like to ask um, Jerry if he would please close in prayer. So if you'll all stand and take up your hymnals and open them up to page 16. On page 16, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 19. The heavens, Yah's glory do declare. That's on page 16, after um, which we'll be led in the closing prayer by Jerry Shlesky. Page 16, the heavens, Yah's glory do declare. Okay, if you will remain standing, we'll turn the mic over to Jerry Shlesky. Jerry, over to you. Jerry, are you there? I think you might be on mute. I don't know about anybody else, but I can't hear you. I hear something. That's Wes. Yeah. Is my mic on? Yeah, I'm going to mute you. Jerry, I don't know if you can hear me. Can anybody hear me? Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, Eric, would you like to close in prayer? I don't know if kind of putting you on the spot here. Okay. Eric, Aristide, please close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our God, thank you for having been with us during this Sabbath services. 
Thank you for your word on which we still ask you to open our understanding. Thank you for life and thank you for all. May your holy name be glorified. Now we ask you, Father, to bless us and to bless the remaining of this day. Stay with us, Father, and help us to live and really shine for your glory. Put your strength into our weakness and help us to overcome Satan and his co-workers forever. Prepare us for your glorious kingdom. We pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ, our only template. Amen. <laughs>